Every year in February, uh, EFCA pastors gather at a conference that the denomination, our denomination puts on. I attended this year, it was not far away, Arlington Heights, so not much of a drive for me, but it was fascinating to see pastors from all over the country. There were pastors from the East Coast with their sport coats on and their fancy shoes, and then I sat next to a pastor from so far north, he basically said he lives in Canada. Uh, He had a hat on with a fishing lure on the brim of his hat, and here were all these individuals pastoring in our denomination all around the country, serving as local embassies of a kingdom in their particular nook and cranny, whether it's literally Washington, D.C., Uh, or various parts of Virginia where a few of these pastors I was talking to were from, or from the northernmost or even southernmost parts of the country in rural areas, small churches and big churches. These are all individuals that are part of our denomination. I was just reminded about the diversity of God's people. And if you just think that's that's just our denomination and that's really just the United States of America, just think about all the kingdom embassies around the world people that speak different languages and eat different foods, some of whom have no idea there's a football game going on today, but they do know it's the Lord's Day as we do, gathering today to worship the Savior and Creator as we properly should. And I was encouraged by that. We're continuing in the Ten Commandments today, and as we've worked through these, we've, this is the third that we'll cover today. As we work through these, I realize that there can be a depth of understanding that, that, that I've tried to express, a thicker reading maybe that's, that maybe is as, as, that tries to go beyond some of the surface understandings, even as we'll see today, taking the name of the Lord in vain might include not saying it frivolously or when we slam our thumb with a hammer, but it's way beyond that. And I realized that even as we talked last week about images just in conversations with some of you, my brothers and sisters, that there could be confusion about that. And I wanted to make a couple comments about that before we go on to the third. To avoid images of God does not mean that it's inappropriate to have the cross. The cross represents not the person of Jesus, but the work of Jesus. So when we have the cross, we're representing his work, his death. A question was raised about nativity scenes, and fair enough. Again, I would argue that nativity scenes are not reflecting the person as much as the event of the birth of Christ, right? So nativity scenes are focusing Christmas on its true purpose. Again, that doesn't mean, even with nativity scenes, that there aren't brothers and sisters in the history of the church that have avoided any kind of little image of Jesus at all. Fair enough. But as I mentioned last week, there has to be some level of Christian liberty that we have to to apply God's word in our way. And I, I, again, I, if asking me personally, and maybe I should have been more clear on this, I, there would, I would give no reservations, certainly by having a cross, which we have right here, and, or even with nativity scenes. Pictures of Jesus uh, have been used for centuries as a teaching tool to explain who Jesus is. The more we get more specific with things like that, I think we want to be cautious uh, we, want to, we want our children or all, any of us to relate to Jesus, but he was not a Swedish man with blue eyes. Uh, he wasn't American. I, I, I've seen pictures of him with military hats or uh, American flags on his shoulders. Again, that to me stretches application beyond where it should go. But in many times and in different ways, images of Jesus are very helpful teaching tools. I do personally feel like probably the most dangerous use of images of Jesus would actually be in film. And I say that not because of just the second commandment itself, though again, like I said, there are Christians who would never touch such things. I think for me, rather than just being the second commandment, I think where films and movies like Passion of the Christ or The Chosen get dangerous is what they add and go beyond Scripture. Like, so me, that's the concern, is that technically... The Bible doesn't give us enough for plot and, lo- and storylines and dialogue. Like, there just isn't enough detail. If it wasn't for the Gospel of John, if we only had Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we wouldn't even know that his ministry was about three years. Just think about that for a second. 
Like, you don't get a lot of time in the Gospels on the details of Jesus' life and ministry, how he sat, where he, what he ate. We just don't get a lot of details on that. But a movie has to fill in the gaps. And when that happens, there's a lot of details that go beyond Scripture. So in one sense, such films are powerful. They're three-dimensional. You're engaging with uh, Jesus in a way that you're not able to do necessarily through the Word of God. But I think they should be held with caution. Uh, again, maybe hold them at arm's length. Just be careful. Where they go beyond Scripture, uh, don't you go there. That, that, I think, would be a healthy posture toward the second commandment. The three commandments that we've looked at thus far, with the third being today, no other gods. The first commandment deals with who we worship. The second commandment, no images, deals with how we worship. The third commandment, I just said no sacrilege. I'll, I'll explain that in a bit. But do not take the name of the Lord in vain. That actually goes back to the first commandment, who, and it deepens it a little bit. It's not just about getting who we worship right. Not It's our God, the God versus other gods. It's actually treating God in a way that reflects and honors who he fully is. I would think that this is probably the commandment that's, generally speaking, been viewed as the least complex. As, as Vera rightly said, we probably just think, I just can't say GD or OMG. That's basically kind of where we can land with it and feel like we've accomplished what the third commandment is trying to say. And I would like to show you today, throughout Scripture actually, that not taking the name of the Lord in vain has a very thick understanding, not just throughout church history, but even in God's Word. But before we look at it, let's, let's pray and ask the Lord to minister to us this morning through His Word. Father, we take seriously Your Word and Your laws, and of spending this season in the beginning of 2022 to study Your Ten Commandments. We want to make sure that we worship no other God but you. We want to make sure that the way we think and portray you matching the second commandment is accurate and biblical and God-honoring. And we want to make sure that your name, which we have taken, we come in the name of Christ today. We sing in your name. We pray in your name. We just did communion in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We are Christian that is, our, that is our name. We've been adopted into your family, under your name. We want to make sure we understand what that rightly means. So help us to grasp what that means today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here would be my, my, my brief summary of what the third commandment forbids. The third commandment forbids. Remember, there's ten commandments. Eight of them are forbidding something. Eight of them are do nots, and two of them are, are do the third commandment forbids any use of God's name that is irreverent or for personal benefit. It's that last kind of statement for personal benefit that we want to focus on a bit today. Most Christians assume the word take, as in verse 7 there in Exodus 20, you should not take the name of the, of the Lord your God in vain. Most think, think take simply is, is a synonym for speak, like don't say it. As if the command is simply dealing with cussing. And, and to be fair, that is, is an application. But it is far from being the most important thing that this commandment is trying to communicate. The Hebrew word for take doesn't mean speak, but lift up, or carry, or bear. The same way you say, would you like to take something home with you? You will grab it, claim it, and use it. So to take the name of the Lord your God in vain is to claim it or use it in a certain way, not merely just to speak it. In that sense, then, the commandment is not just talking with our, about our lips and what they, what they do, but with our lives, Every, every sin, in a sense, a Christian commits is a violation of those who have the name of Christ. Now remember, before we, before we hear that and say, 
Lord, how is it possible that I could obey this commandment? Well, the answer that the gospel would give is quite simply, you cannot obey it. Remember what I said earlier on in this series, if you were here? This command is, is, is spoken in the singular. The you is not plural, because God knew, even though he's commanding all of us to abide by this, he knows full well that only one person would ever obey this command, and his name was Jesus, in whom we put our faith and give our lives. He lives and has lived a perfect life for us and died a sacrificial death for us. And in response, we try to emulate Christ. We try to be like Jesus and honor God the Father. So beyond the word take, what about the, what about the word name? Name in the Bible. We've spoken about this before in this church. Name in the Bible is more than the title of a person. Name isn't just a description. Tom, Billy, big guy. It refers more than just to a title but to things like a person's reputation, authority, and character. Someone's name is not just what they're called, but who they are. So when we pray in the name of Jesus, it's it's not a magical slogan that opens up doors. It is claiming his character, his work in our life, our identification with him, what he has accomplished. We are, we are utilizing the authority and the reputation power that belongs to him as part of God's children. We pray in his name. We only have access to God the Father through the name of Jesus, meaning through the person and work of Jesus. So not just his title, but what he's done. So for God's people, this commandment is forbidding the use of their relationship and knowledge of God for any kind of gain or advantage. Even the word vain, you shall not take, which means more than speak, but carry the name of the Lord, which means more than the word, but the identity of God in vain. Vain means in a worthless way, to no good purpose. So nothing wicked, nothing worthless, or wrong purposes. This commandment not only demands that our worship must be properly honoring to God, but that we must avoid the ways, the many ways we might inappropriately carry or use the name of God for personal gain. I'll talk more about that in a few moments. I'll get to some specifics. In the name of God, we access the Father, we pray, we are baptized. Do you feel the weight of this commandment? How much more it is than don't say GD or OMG? It's more than that. In fact, this is the only of the Ten Commandments that carries a specific discipline listed if it is broken. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. In a sense, God is saying, don't you dare use my character, my reputation, my holiness to advantage you. That doesn't belong to you. That belongs to me. In short, this commandment is warning us that God is not a means to an end. God's not a means to an end. That's why I say this commandment can just be summarized. If the first commandment was no other God's, Second commandment is no images. Third commandment is no sacrilege. Sacrilege is the violation or stealing of anything sacred that belongs to God. It's his. It's not ours. So let's look at this more closely. Second point this morning, the third commandment demands that Christians represent God in a fitting manner. You can see how much bigger this is. It's like you have a name. You represent an institution. You represent the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're overseas, you may represent the United States. Whether you carry a flag or not, you're an American, and they'll see it. Or your family name, you represent your parents, or your children in ways represent you. You understand what that means. This commandment is saying you represent God. For the Christian, the name of God is not merely a word we say, but our worship and our identity. We bear the name of Christ. Genesis 1, we are made in his image, which not only means we have a unique relationship to God that is unique of all creatures, but that we literally represent him in creation. 
So what then does the third commandment specifically forbid? Based upon what the word name can mean, I, I would like to say it forbids an improper use of, of his name, his authority, and his reputation. Let me hit on all three of those. God's name should never be used in ways that reflect ignorance, profanity, or superstition. Again, this is probably the most common use that we have, that we wouldn't want someone to say the name of God or the name of Jesus Christ in a flippant way. It's not even just talking about cursing, though, but maybe in a slogan, maybe slang, maybe even catchphrases that are not explicitly commanded. We even could think about this as, a, as our country. How often do we link God's name to our own nation? It's worth asking if we have the authority to do that. In the 1950s, under Eisenhower, the slogan, in God we trust and under God, were added to our money and to our pledge of allegiance. In fact, my kids were shocked when we went to Old World, Wisconsin. Plug, that's a great place to go. But they were shocked when we were in the schoolhouse there and we were reading one of my sons was standing there, this is a few years ago now, and they're reading the Pledge of Allegiance, and they noticed that under God was not in there because that pledge came from the 18... The, the, the co that copy was from the 1800s when under God was not in the Pledge of Allegiance. That came under Eisenhower in the 1950s, 52, 53, 54. Both under God and in God we trust was given as slogans. How about this? You barely hear a State of the Union now or almost any message or speech from a president that doesn't say, God bless America. First time that was used in recorded history, according to the historians, was 1973 by a guy named Nixon. You remember him? Right after he was found guilty for some not too good things. Between 1933 and 1980, that's the only time that was used. And then a politician by the name of Ronald Reagan, in his first State of the Union, used that to close his speech, and since then, it has become the norm. Bill Clinton in 92 started to use that, and you can barely hear a speech where God bless our troops, God bless America, or God bless the United States isn't used. It is worth asking Christians from a kingdom perspective if we have the authority to use that name. Now, if it's used to say Lord as a prayer, Lord, care for our country, well, that's more than appropriate. We should be praying for that all the time. But if it is used as a political move to check the box of God and country, of rural America or religious America, then guess what that would be doing? That would be using the name of God for personal advantage. That's getting political points. But that would be actually breaking the third commandment which it's possible, we don't know their motives, but it's possible every single president who's ever used that may have done that very thing. They know they got to end that way. If they don't end that way, then they lose the religious vote. When it actually should be the religious people saying, don't you, don't you use my Lord's name without proper authority. Don't link him to any one particular country. If he isn't the king of 200 and some countries and every single human and every planet and every star in the solar system, don't be linking him in political ways. A book in 2008 called The God Strategy argued that that is exactly what's been happening. This is part of the branding and politicking that happens. And if you don't say, it's like if you don't wear the, if, if you do wear the American flag on your lapel, nobody notices. But if you don't, you're in trouble. If you don't put your hand over your heart during the Olympics, right, you get in trouble. If, if you do, nobody knows, but if you don't, you, it gets noticed, right? If you don't say, God bless America, Republican, Democrat, Independent, people notice. You got to check the box. If that's for politics, brothers and sisters, that is actually claiming a connection that doesn't belong to us, certainly not just America. Second, it, it, not just the name being used in a flippant slogan catchphrase way, but even God's authority. God's authority should never be used in the form of a vow or an oath or in any way that claims knowledge. Anyone says, thus saith the Lord, is using the name of the Lord in vain. 
The third commandment is often one used where prophecy or someone else claiming to speak on behalf is declared, on behalf of God is declared as wrong. We cannot speak on behalf of God. We do not know. Again, I think we can, we can do this too flippantly. We want to know reasons for things. Well, I think God is careful. Care, it's just not our area. The Ten Commandments give this hedge around God's person and work so that we just tread carefully. We, we, we just do it in a way that shows deference to God, respect to God. He's not just our buddy we're going to watch the Super Bowl with and say, hey, grab me, grab me another diet soda. Or you want some nachos? He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And these commandments are showing us how to engage, even think about him, even to refer to him. And certainly it's not for personal gain or for benefit. So God's name should never be used in a way that reflects ignorance, profanity, or superstition, slogans, or slang. God's authority should never be used in a in a vow or an oath or a knowledge claim, and God's reputation should never be used in a way that promotes our agenda. If we claim to be God's people, i.e. take his name, and then we live like we are not, guess what we're doing? We're breaking the third commandment. If we use God's name to gain something or to look good, guess what we're doing? We're breaking the third commandment. Brothers and sisters, I think even a practical application of this is the way that we can even make a comment and say, I'm going to pray for you, or I'm gonna, I'm, I'll be praying for you, brother or sister, and honestly, we know that that's the thing you're supposed to say, but if we don't do it, we are, we are making ourselves look good by using God's name. Or how about this? How about... The way that we can pray could do that. All of a sudden, we sound like the great Martin Lloyd-Jones. Dearest Father in heaven, greatest of all kings. I mean, our our vocab changes because we're praying in front of people who hear us, though the last time we prayed might have been seven weeks ago before the holy God. Like all of those practices that are just part of our fleshly selves would be breaking the third commandment. If we use the Bible for our own agenda and justify what we want, we take his name in vain. That is not our property and belongs to his authority and reputation. If we connect our politics to God, or as I mentioned earlier, politicians using God language for votes, that is breaking the third commandment. The Westminster Catechism larger even includes things like this. We shouldn't even pry or debate too hard into God's providence, which we love to do. What's the reason for this? What's the reason for this? That doesn't belong to you. We don't want to be too curious, it says, or unprofitable with our questions of God. Even holding false doctrines or opposing God's truth the Westminster Catechism would say is breaking the third commandment. That's just way bigger than, hey, when you hit, the, you hit your thumb with a hammer, don't say a, a G, the G word. It's about how we even engage with who he is and what he said and what he commands. If we're claiming or abusing anything of regarding who he is or what he said, we're breaking the third commandment. Feel how much this commandment then is addressing God's otherness, his holiness. And it reminds us who we are. We can't even link him to our own country in certain ways without going beyond what belongs to us. We can't. That belongs to him. So this commandment demands that Christians represent God in a fitting manner regarding the use of his name and his authority and his reputation. Inappropriate uses in those ways are forbidden. What what, what could we say that it requires? Here's the positive of this command. God's name is to be held in high regard with honor and reverence. His, His name, we just don't speak it frivolously. Beyond even cussing, we just, we just don't. We, we just don't link it to everything. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't link him to all our human activities as if they can be equated. 
And it means that God's reputation and authority are held by him alone and supported by us as his people. I give you question, the answer to question 112 in the larger Westminster Catechism there in your notes. It's loaded. It's written by people long gone, hundreds of years ago. But listen to what they say. The third commandment requires that the name of God, and then the list, his titles, his attributes, his ordinances, the word, sacraments, prayer, oaths, vows, lots, meaning his providence, what he's doing, his works, and whatsoever else there is whereby he makes himself known, be holily, how often do you use that adverb, be holily and reverently used in thought, just the way we think, in meditation, in word and writing, by an holy profession and answerable conversation to the glory of God and the good of ourselves and others. Like we just, we just don't, we just don't use God as our slogan. We just don't use our connection to him for a personal gain. If you say you're going to pray for somebody, brothers and sisters, you pray for them. When you are praying, you pray in a way to the best of your ability that actually isn't about you. I remember hearing a professor at Biola before a chapel, we would gather, and I, I gathered with him. He was in my department, and he leaned over to me, and he said, just before the group was going to pray, before he was going to speak, he's like, he goes, Mickey, I, I can never speak without thinking about my own, how I will be perceived. How, and I know, ultimately, I just want to present Christ but it is so hard for me to not think about me. Would you pray for me about that? Like how, how honest is that kind of reflection? We want to look good. We want to sound smart. We want to look Christian. We want to look prayerful in all the ways that we do that. We are actually using God for personal gain. Ultimately, the third commandment, this is the last thing I'll say to you this morning, the third commandment shepherds us to see that Jesus Christ is the means by which the name of God is properly honored and lifted up. I, I, think, I think the weight of these Ten Commandments, and here's where they're taking us, because we're three commandments in. You know what the weights of these commandments should do to you and me? Like, you hear the, the first commandment, no other gods, the second commandment, no, no images, the third commandment, no sacrilege or profaning God's name, reputation, and authority. And if, if you're hearing them rightly, here's what you're hearing. Lord, I break those every day. I think of my benefits package with Jesus all the time. I like to look good and Christian, not even just in the world, maybe, in my judging their sinful actions and not looking at my own heart, but even in my church. How many times have I said, I'll pray for you and walked right away? Because that's what you're supposed to say. How many times have I linked you to my family or my country or something here when you've never given me permission to link you in that way? But that's the point. The Apostle Paul said that the purpose of the law was not so that we knew what we could do, so that we could access God, but so that we would see ourselves for who we truly are, sinners who need the grace of the cross. This draws us to Jesus. That's why we are encouraged that even when God spoke this command and wrote this to Moses, the you in verse 7 of Exodus 20 is a singular because who honored the name of God to perfection in everything he did and everything he said? His name is Jesus. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then by faith you are fulfilling the first commandment and the second commandment and the third commandment. And now live your life in Christ 
wanting to mold your life and form your life so that God receives all the honor and praise that he is due. The third commandment shepherds us to see that Christ is the means by which the name of God is properly honored and lifted up. All the weight and force of the name of God has been placed on the Son, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. The Father is known through and by the name of Jesus. That's why from a young age, teach your children and grandchildren to pray in Jesus' name because you have no access to the Father. And that isn't just a that it's kind of a rights thing. That's just a reality. You have no rights before God without Jesus. And the little, little kids can pray in Jesus' name. That, that second text that Mark read, Philippians 2, after talking about Christ's humble service for the church, the Apostle Paul says this, starting in verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him, the him is Jesus, and bestowed on him the name, the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And just so you don't miss the every, he says, in, on, and under all things. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This means that the more we let Christ be the center and means of our worship and our identity, the more we properly honor the name of God. To live is Christ, full stop. This also means that the more we serve Christ, the more we act like Christ, the more we properly lift up the name of God. So what does, by way of application, what does the third commandment, obeying the third commandment look like? It, 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 for us, it means guard your words and your deeds. Don't you dare link God's name to anything that he has not given specific permission. Don't you dare claim a uh, insight or knowledge to who God is or what he's doing that doesn't belong to you. Don't you make yourself look good for personal gain, political benefit, personal spiritual maturity in any way. That belongs to God alone. You represent Christ in all you do. When you're watching a game today, talking with friends or family, when you're at work or when you're walking the hallways at Hananiga or wherever you go to school, when you're cleaning and working and doing the things you're supposed to do, do you know who you represent? You represent God, and you take that seriously. Guard your hearts. Treat God with holy reverence in every corner of your life. And that way, brothers and sisters, you will be honoring the name of God, which is the name above every name, and obeying the third commandment. Let's pray. Father, help us to see the holiness of God, how your word wants in one sense to separate us, that God is completely other, that we are small, and insignificant before a holy God so that we can rightly know who he is and respond to him appropriately. Yet by the grace of your word, it also shows us how Jesus Christ has entered into our realm and given us full access to God the Father and all the benefits of life in him. Help us never to take that for granted. Help us never to... Claim a spiritual insight or authority to leverage our connection to God that makes ourselves look good. Father, we are, we, we are by nature acting that way regularly. Forgive us and help us to guard our hearts and, and make our words and deeds reflect the honorable name of God in all things. God, you... You are not a slogan we can connect to our work, our country, our lives frivolously. 
you are completely other. We are in submission and service to you. Thank you for Jesus who fulfilled this commandment and helps us properly worship a God who is worthy to be worshipped. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.